Before we get into the episode, a quick reminder that this podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only, and nothing should be construed as investment or legal advice. If you are enjoying OnRamp Media content, please like, subscribe, and share as it goes a long way in helping others find the signal through the noise. Now for a word from OnRamp, OnRamp is a Bitcoin asset management platform built on multi-institution custody. Leveraging our partnership with BitGo and their 10 plus year track record in securing assets, and CoinCover, the premier digital asset risk mitigation company, OnRamp's multi-institution custody is a segregated institutional grade vault requiring two of three institutions at any point in time to sign once a client's unique permissions have been met. At OnRamp, we understand that your Bitcoin journey is a multi-generational pursuit, catalyzed by the ideals of perseverance, aspiration, and legacy. That's why we're proud to introduce OnRamp Heritage, a suite of private client services dedicated to ensuring your Bitcoin legacy is preserved and passed on, embodying the true essence of wealth that goes beyond mere numbers. If you would like to learn more, please schedule a consultation. What you're telling me is that music is about to stop, and we're going to be left holding the biggest bag of odorous excrement ever assembled in the history of that business. 1974, 1987, 92, 97, 2000, and whatever we want to call this. It's all just the same thing over and over. We can't help ourselves. I say when we sell. Hey, 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 I so say when we sell. Woo, doggy. Gentlemen, <laughs> we're in epoch number five. First rip yeah. of epoch number five. How are we feeling? Feeling good. Feels, feels like nothing's changed. Feels like the having didn't do anything, guys. You didn't, <laughs> we're in the death spiral right now. This is a, right. this is a funeral episode. Death spiraling. Yeah, I don't know. I heard I heard the fees are, you know, the block reward's so low now that uh everything is gonna die, right? Bitcoin's over. Yeah. It's cancelled. Yeah. We should all go home. The overlords yeah, yeah. yeah. All those people who are excited about the having, they really have egg on their face because nothing happened. <laughs> and nothing will happen as a result of this having. I'm I sure. Say, I will say the death spiral FUD was not as pronounced as it has been uh in That's cycles true. past. Last cycle, it was really loud. Like, you know, there they serious people were concerned that mining would, you know, be unsustainable, and that we didn't have that at all this time. They're they're perceived to be serious until they start talking about that spiral fund. Ari Paul, um, gentlemen, we're joined by Peruvian Bull, the infamous Peruvian Bull, founder of the Dollar Endgame Substack. Welcome to the show. How have you been? It's been like a year since I caught up with you. Yeah, I've, I've been good. I've been good. I've been busy. I uh, quit my job in fintech and I started doing this full time, doing research and writing. Um, yeah, went to the Adopting Bitcoin conference in El Salvador, spoke there. I've been in, uh, living in Medellin, Colombia, meeting a ton of Bitcoiners, um, making a lot of great connections. So a lot of huge changes, but I'm bullish on the future of Bitcoin, I'm bullish on my future. I'm I'm excited to be here. I'm bullish on on ramp. Yeah, everything. You, you weren't just uh, fintech. You were in like fintech PE, right? Yeah, yeah. I was doing like uh, valuations for uh, early stage startups, mostly software companies and some biotech, um, for a couple of years. And then I was I was so interested in macro. I was diving deep down the rabbit hole and I started writing on Reddit. I wrote this series called Dollar Endgame, which was about the monetary system and changes of reserve currencies and why the dollar and trip and dilemma would eventually cause things to run up. Um, and this and is just, just a, this is just a camera switch. You're, you're OK, this. OK. Yeah, this uh, I, I thought you guys dropped me. Um, yeah, so I I wrote this series and it's funny because I, I didn't even, I think I told Marty this, I didn't anticipate it being anything bigger than what it was. I wrote the first post and then it went to like 500,000 views on Reddit and I was like, whoa, like this is huge. And so a lot of people said, we want to hear part two, what happens after Nixon goes off the gold standard and Triffin's Dilemma starts kicking in. And so then I wrote part two, part three, wrote a whole series and then just started going on Twitter, started writing Twitter threads, those started blowing up and 
I was like, wow, there's enough demand for this content that I'll, I'll quit my job and do this full time. And so that's what I've been, what I've been doing for the past six months or so. Yeah, it's awesome. And, and I, I just love how the, the people like you, you know, come from a background of, of like doing macro analysis, doing like valuation analysis, and then things aren't adding up. And, you know, it's not like you're uninformed. In fact, you're too informed. And then you figure out, you know, this, this doesn't make sense. Something's wrong here. And then you go down the rabbit hole. And I, I think that that's very telling, uh, that people who, who know too much end up, uh, Bitcoiners. Yeah. We all get, we all get orange pilled eventually. Right? Like that's, that's the thing. I, I actually, unfortunately in about 2018, I was flooded out of Bitcoin because I read a, a book written by a software engineer and hedge fund manager. Uh, Eric Townsend that basically said, Hey, <laughs> the blocks, the block space is too small to challenge and, or to allow enough, you know, transactions for global output. Like we, you know, this is seven transactions a second. We need 60,000. So it'll never work. And so don't buy Bitcoin. And so I was a gold bug up until about 2021 and the GameStop situation occurred. And then after that happened, a bunch of bit, like I, I blew up. That's when I started really exploding and going viral and a bunch of Bitcoiners started messaging me and saying like, Hey, you should look into this again and arguing with me. And I was like, you know what? I, maybe I should. And then once I read Safety Dean's book and I read block wars, block size wars, uh, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in. Eric, Eric, if you're out there, I've emailed with Eric before being like, Hey, let's talk about Bitcoin. He's like, no, it's not going to work. It's a shame. <laughs> the Macro Voices podcast is a great podcast. Actually, it's one of the few that I still listen to from time to time um but yeah the the macro some of the macro guys particularly the gold bugs not that eric's a gold bug or anything um really misunderstand bitcoin it, it, it's a fascinating dynamic because don't they natural or like every couple months they'll have somebody that's a quote unquote bitcoin expert come on and talk about it and like they're just consistently getting peppered with like different versions of the value prop and where it sits like it's almost like the peter shift side of it like do they get it and they just mm -hmm. they just like are building up that persona that they're not they'll never get bitcoin but they have a bag well once you write a book about it it's hard to uh yeah it's out there it's publicly accessible it's hard to to save face yeah the, the gold bugs really suffer from uh escalation of commitment you know as like a psychological trap where they've invested so much of literal money, but also time and energy and, and, and ego in being right about mm -hmm. gold that they don't want to be wrong. It's a financial and psychological sunk cost fallacy that they're stuck in. Great. Uh, where I was where saying, this? Well, I was going to say going full time. I couldn't imagine a better time to go full time, uh, in the space from like, you know, geopolitical perspective what's happening all the craziness that we saw going on the past two weeks in the middle east um and there's a lot of discussions around you know bitcoin being the first kind of uh, alarm when stuff goes a little hairy uh so yeah i'm sure you have a lot you're writing about right now oh yeah no that's it it's well also i mean it's not only that but the fed's tools and ability to you know stealthily add liquidity into the system is, is expanding you know, things that I wouldn't have found two years ago happening, I, I'm finding that are I'm finding today. Um, like one example is I was doing a recent piece. I wrote it called Stealth QE. It was about different ways that the Fed can add liquidity back into the banking system without actually technically expanding their balance sheet. And um, I did a breakdown of the Fed's balance sheet since the taper um, week over week changes. And I did it by maturity uh, of their treasury debt. And I found out they actually haven't been selling any of their long bonds, like none, anything past 10 year maturity, they haven't been selling, they've only been buying. And so what they've been laying off for the taper is just the T bills, the two year notes, the five year notes and the seven year notes and some tips. And so that was pretty shocking to me because again, like this isn't stuff that's, that's, uh, advertised in the financial media, even though you can find it, if you, you know, know how to use Fred charts well enough, uh, to break down break down what's happening. Um, but yeah, it's, this is a really interesting time to be in global macro. Um, it's a really interesting time to be in Bitcoin. I think, you know, the, the FUD that came out that weekend was hilarious because, you know, I ran, did that drone attack within a, 
within 10 minutes, Bitcoin price begins plummeting. And then you have people, um, you know, I think Nick Timoreos from the Wall Street Journal or whatever coming online and saying, hey, how is this a store of value? It's falling. Oh, my God. Like, this isn't a store of value. It's falling during a conflict. How can you claim this? You know, Bitcoin thesis, dead. Bulls are, bulls are, are ended. And I just had to laugh so hard at that because I was like, either you're you're just ignorant to the point of like stupidity, or you're willingly trying to spread fud and uh, spread disinformation because that that kind of that that kind of talk is ridiculous. I mean, even treasury bonds were fire sold during March 2020, and that's a high quality, you know, liquid asset. So it's ridiculous well, to to make that assumption. I mean, it's important to understand the context that Nick is essentially. The, the Fed whisper is what he's referred right. to um, from the Wall Street Journal. And so he's got a position of access to the Fed and loves that position of access because um, he gets a beat on all the stories. And so it's not surprising that he would um, bad, bad talk Bitcoin, which is a, a big competitor to the thing he has access to and makes his career uh, as successful as it has been, relatively speaking. But with that, like, with that in mind, just like the macro outlook, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on a few of the things going on right now, whether it's that um, sneaky liquidity operations that the Fed is running. A couple of things in the headlines this week, Japanese yen at 155 uh, seems to be, uh, the Bank of Japan seems to be losing control of, of the yen. You had China and Russia come out and announce that they haven't done trades between each other settling in dollars um for some time now and then we had the btfp end last month and it looks like the reverse repo market is draining as well um so there's a lot of things happening both geopolitically on the global macro level and then here at the united states level particularly at the fed um it seems like there's like a, a ticking time bomb going off in terms of liquidity that will probably need to be dealt with at some point. Yeah. All I mean, inflation's no. flying. Yeah. Yeah. It's accelerating, right? The, the last three months have seen increasing prints, which is interesting given that we thought that inflation was canceled if the fed hikes rates to 5%, right? Yeah. They, they, they already defeated inflation. So they're not going to remark on how it's going up right now. <laughs> That, exactly. that war is won. It's already over. Exactly. Yeah. There's a, so there's a lot of threads to pick apart there. Um, uh, I can start wherever you want me to, but um, let's let's start I'll... with Japan because Japan is notoriously for a long time been considered the canary in the coal mine. A lot of people in the macro sphere saying if something's wrong in Japan, that is the leading indicator that something's wrong systemically throughout the global financial system. Yeah, and I, I actually think that that's an apt metaphor. Um, I've written a lot about the Bank of Japan, actually, in my newsletter, probably more than any other country except for the U.S. Um, Japan was at the forefront of you know monetary innovation. They're the ones who started QE in 2002. They're the ones who created yield curve control in 2016. Um, they've pioneered a lot of you know novel ways to add liquidity to the system without trying to cause inflation. And then eventually they tried to cause inflation and for years it wasn't working until now it's actually working and, and causing them a crisis. Um, there, I, I, can't, I, I have this saying of the Bank of Japan is caught in a black hole of their own design. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, for years, uh, I mean, Japan is, has been farther along the curve in terms of debt creation than any other country for years, just because of their demographics and because of their extremely low monetary velocity. And so they've been able to create massive amounts of credit without causing inflation in the traditional sense um, because of those underlying factors. And to save the, the slowly deflating economy, uh, the Bank of Japan in 2016 started yield curve control. They brought rates down to zero and actually negative in in some senses like on the very very short end it was negative point uh one percent i believe um and even on the 10 years negative point one percent was part of the ban for yield curve control and they kept it there for you know basically a decade and what happens when you have zerp for long long periods of time is the debt creation just 
continues and just expands and has no, there's no natural break on lending because there's no cost to lend and there's no cost to borrow. Like, why would you care about your debt levels as a company or as an individual when it costs nothing to roll over and you're not paying any interest? And so by doing this, the Bank of Japan piled more and more debt. And this creates this financial gravity of more and more debt means that if you raise rates, the interest expense will go up. So now you have even more of a reason not to raise rates. And so rates have to stay lower for longer. And so you just keep, you keep adding to the argument of why you should stay in this trap. And that works until your currency starts to blow out, right? Because th this is the issue that the Bank of Japan has been having for like the last two years. Um, I keep saying that they're, they're on a train and they, they're slamming the gas and the brakes at the same time. And the reason I say that is because on one hand, it, like in September of 2022, when they began intervening in their bond or in their currency market by selling bonds, they were selling US treasuries to get dollars to buy yen. But at the same time, they were still continuing their yield curve control program to control their own bond market and keep yield suppressed. So they were printing yen on one hand, and the other hand, they were selling treasuries to get dollars to buy yen on the Forex markets. And so it, it, it's a nonsensical monetary policy that that's self-defeating, right? You're, you're burning the candle at both ends. You can't keep doing two, th two opposite things at the same time and except, except, um, expect both to work out. And so they, they did this for, for months in September, 2022, they began doing this again in, in December and then in, um, July of last year, uh, they kept, they started moving the bands of yield curve control because what they were trying to do was they were trying to alleviate this pressure building on their currency, you know, with this massive debt level and with, uh, inflation beginning to reappear in Japan, it, it printed, I think 2.2% in February, which again, for, for us, doesn't seem that bad, but for Japan, that's like a 30, 40 year high. Um, their currency is just getting weaker and weaker and the yen shorts continue to pile up. And as the Delta between the, the Japanese interest rates and the American interest rates, domestic interest rates rise, carry traders can come in, borrow yen at 1% and buy treasuries at five and profit from it. And essentially what that is, is that's like a synthetic yen short. And so, the Bank of Japan is stuck with this choice, right? Like, what are they going to do if they raise rates to stop the carry trade and stop their currency from blowing out, then their entire economy starts to run into a severe depression and deflation because it can't at 263% debt to GDP, you can't support 5% rates like it's impossible. Um, and if you're, uh, I think I think I did the math, I think it was like for every 1% they raise, they would spend 13% more or something like that of their GDP on, uh, on interest alone. Like wow. it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, it, this is of course in the long run, like over 20 or 30 years, but it's just, they can't raise it that much higher. And so they have this choice of letting the yen blow out or raising rates and trying to stop the yen blowing out, but at the risk of basically pulling their own government into a severe fiscal crisis and pulling their uh, economy into deflation. And so they've been stuck in this trap. And, um, you know, I, when Yen was at 150, I wrote this piece and I said, you know, the Bank of Japan and, and the Maginot Line, I said, this is their line of no return. If they, if this gets crossed, they're probably not going to ever go back. We'll, we may not see Yen at 150 again. And that was last August. And then in March, it crosses 153. And now it's at 154.8. And it just keeps it keeps going and their only real recourse, which can buy them time is selling their $1.1 $1 trillion of us treasuries and using that to buy doll get dollars and using the dollars to buy yen to strengthen their currency. And they can do that, but it'll run that will, they maybe have about, you know, 10 to 12 months of, of capital to do that it, based on their prior run rate of, of 80 billion or so that they were spending in, in September and October of 2022 to, to intervene against their currency. So they're kind of trapped, you know, uh, or not kind of, they are trapped. And so I think the only choice is to either let the yen blow out or, you know, let their economy suffer deflation. And we know central bankers and, and you know, government uh, officials hate the idea of, of the government defaulting and them losing control and losing funding. And so I think the What's going to happen is the yen is just going to have to blow out and they're going to have to suffer currency depreciation for the next 10 years. 
Wow. Yeah, that, that's a great summary of the situation. But what do you say to people, you know, I, I used to spend more time um, paying attention to that part of macro. And when I would talk about it, everyone, a, a common rebuttal would be, well, the Japan's been in trouble for 20 years. You know, the, the, the numbers have looked bad for 20 years. Um, and yet they've made it work. Uh, and, and I have my opinions on why that is, but what do you say to that? Um, I would say like, yeah, yeah, they have been able to kick the can. They have been able to delay the problem, but when it comes to a pro like a, a, a fiscal situation, this dire, you can't escape it forever. Right? Like math eventually catches up to you. And especially for a country that's not a reserve currency, you have the issue of the currency trilemma. You have to either hold, you have to have an open capital account, um, uh, independent monetary policy, you have to choose two of these three, independent monetary policy, open capital account, and uh, freely floating or, or pegged exchange rate. And so if you p pick, you want the pegged exchange rate, and you want independent monetary policy, then you have to close your capital account. And if you want an open capital account, which you need for global trade, then you need to give up either the, the exchange rate or you need to give up the monetary policy. And so what that means is that you basically become like a vassal of the Fed. You have to say, OK, if the Fed raises rates, I raise rates in, in, in synchronicity. If they lower, I lower. I have to follow whatever the Fed does just so that I don't attract, uh, you know, capital flows or capital outflows to, to destroy my currency. And, you know, these processes, as, as we're seeing with the debt crisis, right, these processes are, are exponential. And so what happens is nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, a little bit happens, and then everything happens at the end. Yep. And so for the last 20 years, they've been able to kick the can because nothing was happening and they were able to keep rolling the debt at 0%. And then once the Fed raised rates in 2022, they their currency started to weaken substantially and now they're stuck. And unless they can convince the Fed to, to cut to zero again, uh, which may happen, um, they're going to be trapped. Yeah, but in what you said earlier about the Fed uh, choosing to r roll over the uh, choosing to hold the long term bonds that they're holding doesn't that imply, if anything, they expect inflation rates to remain higher than than uh, the the you know the coupon rate on those bonds, and so those are the attractive ones to keep holding. I think personally, I think it's less of a you know like profit motive play and, and trying to make money off of which bonds are going to make money or which bonds are going to, you know, be returning real returns um, versus nominal and more of a liquidity and overall market structure play. Um, because from what we've been seeing, you know, the treasury itself also has been switching its issuance from the long end of the curve to the short end. So last mm -hmm. November, they put out a press release saying, you know, hey, we're reducing the amount of 30 year and 20 year bonds and we're increasing the amount of two, five and seven year notes we're issuing. And we're doing that on a go forward basis. And this is like a permanent change. And if you look at like the chart of T-bill issuance, which I can I can uh, maybe throw up in on a tweet or something, you can see this exponential rise since COVID of how many T-bills they're issuing this quarter in Q1 of, of this year. Um, yeah, I guess last quarter. Michael Howell pointed out that 71% of the treasury's funding was coming from bills. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is because there's a structural shift away from the long end of the curve in terms of demand towards the short end. And so when you have that happen, you can't keep off laying and trying to sell long bonds because the, the interest rate is just going to blow out. Gotcha. And so I th exactly. So I think yeah. the Fed did that more of a, as a strategic play than a a financial one yeah, more that there's a market for for the higher rate short end of the curve bonds and so that's mm -hmm. what they're going to go offer up and they probably don't want to refinance longer and longer duration bonds right. at these interest yeah. rates so it makes sense but it's, yeah, it's, it's a frankenstein so sorry, sorry response to, sorry to derail you derail you from uh, from japan there because that was you know an, an awesome amount about what's going on there right now and i mean so to bring it all back together, though, like what you're the picture you're painting feels like a G7 nation that is circling the drain and will be the first domino to fall in in our debt based 
a fiat era. Uh, is that your your sense? Yeah, I would I would agree with that sentiment. I just agree. I just think that's a slow motion train crash, right? And ironically, which is this has also been pointed out. Ironically, everything that Japan does will make the problem worse, right? We already covered raising rates will cause them a fiscal crisis immediately, right? They can't afford thirteen percent of their GDP every year spent on interest, and they can't really cut without causing more inflation. Although that's probably the choice they're going to make. But more than that, if they sell U.S. Treasuries, there's another hidden feedback loop where when they interest rates rise in the U.S., obviously, because bond prices and rates are inversely correlated. And then the carry trade just opens up even further and more people pile into the carry trade and their currency blows out even more in the long run. Right. In the short run, they can they can tamp the price down. They can use those dollars to buy back yen. But in the long run, it just widens the delta between the rates and then more and more it's more and more profitable for hedge funds and institutions to pile in on the yen carry trade. So yeah. they're trapped. Does Rocking this scare the shit way. out does this scare the shit out of the Treasury? Because you consider the fact that they had a weak ten year auction a couple of weeks ago. And then the Treasury just recently opened up the buyback window. They announced it last year. It officially opened back up a couple of weeks ago as well. Um, so many people, that's the first time they've opened it up since post 9-11, 2001. They opened it up during um, the chaos of that era. And interestingly enough, they opened it again. Not as much chaos, one could argue. Um, so with the looming specter of Japan losing control of their currency and trying to maintain control by dumping treasuries. You couple that with like weak auctions that have been trickling in over the last six months and this buyback window. Like it seems like uh, the treasury is scared and what would lead me to believe they are is the fact that they opened up the buyback window because they're going to need somebody to buy these treasuries as Japan's dumping them. Nobody else wants to buy them due to the fracturing in the multipolar world. That we seem to be moving into. Yeah, I think I think that that's broadly accurate. I, I there's one you know headline you guys might have missed a few weeks ago in in early March, um, the International Securities Derivatives Association, which is essentially all the large banks, wrote a letter to the Fed and the OCC and the CFTC, I believe, and believe and basically said, hey, look. You know, you granted us an SLR exemption for treasuries in March 2020 for a year, and that was massively helpful in absorbing treasury issuance. And we want you to grant that again, and we want it to be permanent. And basically what they were saying behind the curtain is, look, like the treasury issuance is starting to grow exponentially. We can't, we don't have the balance sheet capacity to hold all this. And if, if you grant us an SLR exemption, which is basically in like bank capital terms means that they won't have to hold capital against their um, against any treasury holdings. Because what the SLR is, is basically, it's, just, it's called the supplementary leverage ratio. It's basically a, a ratio that they use to hold, to calculate how much capital they need to hold against an asset losing value. So if it's, you know, if they have uh, reserves or cash at the Fed, they don't, they don't need to have any. If it's uh, an MBS or an agency MBS, they need to have a little bit. If it's a treasury, they need to have a little bit. If it's obviously a higher risk loan or some other investment, they need to have a lot more. And so by doing this, it would basically free up a bunch of bank capital and allow banks to acquire almost infinite treasuries. I mean, this is basically like QE for the banks. And yeah. so Luke, Luke Roman has pointed this out and it's, it's very telling that we're, we're not in any sort of conventional crisis, but what I would say is the debt is the crisis. And this is what's causing these moves to be made behind the scenes of the treasury shifting issuance and the banks requesting SLR exemptions so that they can just absorb this massive wave. Yeah. I think we talked about this a few weeks ago, but it's hilarious that they're doing this, particularly on the back end of last year, because of they were able to take the treasuries out of the leverage ratio last year during the banking crisis. It's arguable that like SVB first Republic Silvergate signature would not have gone down. And it highlights the, um, the, not the ambiguity, the, uh, the, um, arbitrariness of all the rules. It's like, Oh, we'll just change them on the go. Um, what was a rule last year and forced many banks to fail. It's not there anymore. Um, hmm. it's 
convenient. It, they're, they're changing everything on the go, which is not confidence inducing in any way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But there was one, one more, um, um, headline that people might've missed uh, from Japan recently, it was about a month ago. Um, I forget what the exact, you know, who, who, who said this or what it, but it amounted to, um, Japan is, is pushing hard to open up immigration and bring a lot of immigrants to Japan. And, and that to me sounds like a bit of a, a desperate attempt to try to stave off deflation. Um, a, and and bolster their economy and, and spread out that financial pain um, that, that they're going to have to digest at some point. Uh, you know, it, it and, and in doing so kind of turns its back on um, thousands of years of, of, of Japanese heritage and, and pride in, in their um, social um, social setup in that country it's, as a uh, um, homogenous as it, as it may be, it's, it's that, that, uh, approach to culture has resulted in, you know, a, a country they're very proud of and a culture they're very proud of. And, and, uh, they're trying now to change that, uh, all of a sudden. And that's r- remarkable to me because it, it, um, is the potentially the early death rattles of, of fiat, um, you know, trying to sterilize, uh, the world by, well, an, an outcome of, of fiat trying to protect itself or, or propagate itself and, and survive, um, and is willing to pull a desperate lever to change the social composition of a country that prides itself on its history and, and composition. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, they, an interesting fact, uh, fun fact for you guys is for the last, I think it's been like 17 years more adult diapers for seniors have been sold in Japan than baby diapers. <laughs> there you go. There's a stat. Holy shit. That is yeah. a stat. <clears throat> so they, they, they have a demographic crisis and if they're going to try to grow their way out of this problem at all, which it's too late, but they're going to try now mm-hmm. to grow their way out of it. A way you can do that is bring in people who have more babies than the Japanese now do. Uh, they seem and- like the they're not going to do that though. Um, There's a huge resistance from the people of Japan to, you know, what they would, what they would view as, uh, you know, casting out the, the homogeneity that they are proud of, uh, and, and historically have maintained in their country. Um, and that's going to be a major source of friction if if the you know the government and the g7 basically pushes that angle for how japan might be able to shore itself up for a little bit longer um and and there might be a lot of pushback from the public i think i think i think it's actively happening right like i think if you're where you're referring to is i think peter st Arms. they said they're shipping like some crazy amount of maybe that's where i got it from uh, from external countries to Japan. And this is like, this is kind of like fringe, but I think I've heard from multiple people, this is the, their thesis on what's happening in the States from a border perspective of why so many people are coming in to the US and it's allowed from, from all over the world. Um, I don't know how true it is, but what Jesse just described is like what some people will look at from the border no, just, crisis here. You look at the jobs numbers, it seems to be playing out, whether it's explicit or implicit in the Biden administration's efforts and um their end goal but you just look at the jobs numbers the amount of foreign born individuals who are taking most of the jobs these days i mean that yeah. is an attempt to tamper wage inflation um so that right. people don't have more money to get per- spend and bid up the price of goods peruvian hit us with a, a, a stat I, I heard one today um one out of three 18 year old um to high school diploma males are out of a jo- or don't have a job. So two thirds of people that went to high school are working. One third of all males do not, aren't working right now currently. Wow. That's unreal. It, like in what age bracket? That's incredible. Uh, that's a good question. Like age bracket in the, from yeah. like, like 20 to 40. Prime yeah. working years. Brutal. Yeah. Yeah, the, the employment part. numbers are, are all just like absolutely insane on how, uh, and that's with two trillion deficits. Like yeah, that's right. with the, the getting juice. 
And and this is like what we're talking about here is such an outcome of uh, Keynesian policy deciding that the important metrics are these certain growth metrics. And, you know, and, oh, we can continue printing money and running up the deficit and whatnot so long as we deliver GDP growth, uh, so long as we have job growth. That's what matters. And, you know, that's such a shame because in my opinion, and I think all of our opinions, that's, that's the wrong metric. You know, it, it, a better metric would be um, purchasing power of the, you know, the median um, citizen growing over time, which is, is diametrically opposed to what fiat can do because fiat is designed to debase. Uh, and whereas Bitcoin delivers on that kind of uh, metric and allows the average person to grow their purchasing power over time by saving in Bitcoin and utilizing its increasing scarcity, its savings technology properties that allows for that metric. But since fiat doesn't allow, doesn't optimize for, you know, the growth of the median net worth, basically, or purchasing power, um, then you better not pay attention to that as, and, and hold that up as an important metric. Instead, you should find other metrics that you can make look good, like jobs growth or GDP growth. Um, because in that, you know, in the nominal world where you're printing more money, those things end up looking good. And th like, that's the, the source of all this bad policy is that we have, because of fiat, because of our monetary system, we have spotlighted the wrong metrics because those are the metrics that can, we can make look good. And, and I think to a large extent, people at the top have convinced themselves those are the metrics that matter when, you know, if you take in any sort of rational, reasonable approach to thinking about what actually matters to the average American, it's it's their life getting better over time, not how many jobs they have to hold to make ends meet. And the, the funny thing is, if you look below the surface too, like the jobs numbers aren't even as good as they claim they are. Right, I'm actually doing rising them down. Yeah, well, the, so that's the first thing. I, I'm doing okay. a research piece right now on, you know, government manipulating jobs numbers. And the, the more I dig into it, the more and more suspect it gets. Um, yeah, last, last November, um, the BLS came out and said they had to erase 400, backwardly erase 439,000 jobs from their numbers for the year because they overestimated how many full-time and part-time workers there were. Did, and did they do that in, loudly or quietly after the fact? They did it quietly after the fact. Their, their policy is basically they'll put out a really great jobs number and two months later, there's a quiet revision where they drop about 30 or 40 percent, even sometimes 50 percent of the number from the official stat and then just never mention it. And only people who are journalists or uh, statisticians find the changes in the data. Um, but even if you believe the headline numbers, if you look below like the surface, it's not great. It's the entire rise is coming from part-time workers. Full-time workers has actually mm -hmm. been falling since 2022. And so we're in a kind of a quiet recession where all these full-time workers are getting laid off and people are getting part hired for part-time gigs for Uber, you know, for Lyft, that kind of thing, but they're not getting, you know, software engineers and lawyers are, are losing, losing employment. And so that's, that's not a sign of a healthy economy. And the fact that they keep putting this stuff out there is, is ludicrous. Uh, one other last thing I'll mention is a few days ago, Jim Bianco pointed this out. There's an unemployment filings number that the government releases every, every week. And he said for six of five of the last six weeks, the number has been exactly the same. It was 212,000. <laughs> I saw that. And that's, that's a, like, that's it's impossible. Statistically statistics. impossible. Yeah. yeah. They ran like the stand, like the, uh, you know, the probability of it. It's literally some, it's remarkable. some crazy infinitesimal probability where it's this literally is, impossible. This is also why it's been important in the past year as folks have come on and we, we talk about the fed speak, just calling it out because anecdotally we all have to live in the real world and we know this is happening and nobody goes and talks about it. They just talk about inflation being some, you know, reduced and like employment coming back and the reality is like the economy's fucked. <laughs> we keep getting let, laid off. Yeah, we, we do fall for, we, we, we talk about the numbers that the headlines talk about, and that's like jobs numbers and GDP growth. And, and we awesome. don't talk about the metrics that matter to real people um, because it's kind of, as, as 
you know, Peruvian bullets pointed out, it's kind of hard to find those, those numbers and, and, you know, uh, reliable numbers for the metrics that matter more. Yeah, and completely. It's, it, it's a disconnection. So I've written, I've actually wrote a piece about this and it's a disconnection of the financial and the real economy, right? What, what the Fed has done is essentially financialized the entire market to the point where now, now stocks can just keep rising due to liquidity programs without any fundamentals because right. the correlation between central bank assets and, you know, broad equity indexes is nearly one. And, and, and so just everyone on Wall Street ratios. Yeah, exactly. Everyone on Wall Street can think that everything's great just because the, the spy keeps rising and because QQQ is rallying hard. And in reality, the amount of homeless, the amount of drug addicts, the amount of people without full-time employment keeps dropping. You know, and so it's this complete disconnection between the economies. And it's it's really sad to see because, you know, the, the market should be driven from fundamental growth, not the other way around. We shouldn't be saying, oh, the market's rallying. What's the fundamental justification? We should say, oh, look, we had a great you know quarter of economic growth and therefore the markets will rally because now there are people have more investments, more savings. They can they can buy a home. They can pay for college. They can go to do some business owners can create more productive uses for their capital, et cetera. Right. And instead, it's the opposite. And you see this anecdotally. I mean, I'm sure we've all seen the TikTok videos on Twitter of people complaining about inflation, whether it's here or in Canada. Um, I think it's at the point where I think I see 10 or 11 of them a day where it's not. It doesn't seem to be people clout chasing for views. These people seem genuinely in distress. Um, and it's the same story. It's like, I, I go to work, I work multiple jobs, uh, and I can't afford my life. And it's, that's where we have to break out of the mirage of the fake data that all these institutions are putting out there. And like you said, Michael, just got to call it out. It's complete bullshit. And like bringing this back to Japan and thinking of like, how do you fix this? Like, I actually wouldn't be surprised if Japan considering all the pride that they have and <clears throat> their strive to preserve their culture. If they're one of the first G sevens to throw the hail Mary and say, you know what, we're dumping our treasuries and putting a big portion into Bitcoin because if Bitcoin succeeds and we have that asset on our country's balance sheet, maybe we can solve some of these systemic demographic problems that we have throughout the economy. Well, yeah, I think I think that that's accurate. I mean, uh, last year I read, um, I think it was a history of money and banking in the United States by Rothbard. Yep. And one of the things that surprised me. I've been reading me that is, recently too. It's a great, it's a great read. It's a long read. So I'll just warning to anyone who wants to, to dive dense. in. It's a, it's very dense and he's very technical and has a lot of like, you know, key data and, and source data that he, he gets, but one of the things that's fascinating is like in the period from 1883 to like 1903, 1904, um, there was compounding 5%, 6% real wage growth every year for 20 years. Wow. And there was almost no inflation. There was extreme growth in, in productivity in capital, uh, capital growth, overall capital growth and capital management, the ability of $1 of new capital to create X amount of dollars of GDP, like in every single metric, right? The U S was just booming. And in 20 years, we experienced probably one of the first large periods of, of great innovation that propelled us into you know the 21st century, what we are now the digital age ever, because we had the com internal combustion engine, we had the cotton gin, we had telegrams, uh, telegraph wires being being invented, you know the the car at the the early stages of what would become planes. So. It was just a massive period of innovation. And, and that period was marked by basically no inflation, sound money, minimal government and minimal intervention in the economy. And so I, I think people don't realize, like I, on the one hand, it is easy to get black pilled, right? Of saying, hey, look, things are so horrible. Like the fiat has fucked everything up so badly. And that is true. But it's also good to know, like on the plus side, things will become so much better under a Bitcoin standard or under a sound money standard than anyone can ever believe. Thanks for tuning in. If you're interested in exploring any of these topics further or want to learn more about how we can help you secure a new or existing Bitcoin allocation, 
Get in touch with our team at onrampbitcoin.com. We look forward to supporting you on your Bitcoin journey. No, just to say we're, we're right there. That's the funny part. It's like the, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. It's like, how do we get there? That's what we're all trying to do is like accelerate it. But like what you just referenced between the, the internet, Bitcoin, uh, you know, let's call it AI, like somebody with a laptop can create so much value to increase that, you know, one dollar, one Bitcoin spent year over year. It's just we need to get there. And, and that's the whole part. It's like everybody else catching up. Um, but you can see it. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting that, that that time period that you referenced, that 20 years right at the end of turn of the century back then, um, it, it had such tremendous economic productivity. And yet there's like a dual narrative about it, about that time period that, it, you know, it's referred to as the, the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era, which really sp speaks to the two sides of the coin there of like Gilded Age because so much wealth was created but progressive era because there was uh, these advancements of social causes and trying to, you know, rein in the, the robber barons. Um, you know, you had that famous photographer go take photos of child labor and then push for child labor laws, Lewis Hines, I think. Um, and, you know, it's kind of which side of the coin do you look at, do you focus on? And I think the narrative that has perpetuated from that time period is that, that the robber barons were like evil and grabbing power and, and money and, and wealth and while building railroads, you know, that like that, that was a, somehow a bad thing. Um, but the, you know, if you look at the data there, like you have, it sounds like pretty, pretty darn good for the average worker. If you're going to have 5%, um, Kager in, in real wages through that 20 year period, um, that's incredible. And, so I, I think that, you know, it's also probably a, a bit of a premonition about what we'll be dealing with from a narrative point of view about Bitcoin as, you know, a, the Bitcoin standard um, in states and amplifies the sort of deflationary advantages that the Gilded Age and Progressive Era enjoyed with the gold standard. But we will have the same dynamics of like massive productivity and wealth creation um centralizing to some extent in a few hands but but also mm -hmm. being passed down to you know the average person but that the spotlight will be on the, the wealth creation and and we'll have sort of our, our new bitcoin robber barons that will will get terrible press from the public and we'll see what the narrative is about about um an age of prosperity is it, is it going to be gilded age is it going to be progressive era sins um it'll probably be both yeah, that's that's a really good point to bring up because, you know, a lot of people point out that, yeah, wealth is on a parade of distribution, right? Like wealth is unfortunately an exponential function where a few people have a lot of wealth. Um, and a lot of people view that as as an outcome of the system being unfair or the system, you know, being rigged in some way. And of course, there are, you know, obvious ways in which the wealthy can manipulate things and uh, use government subsidies for their own benefit. Um, but broadly speaking, Pareto distributions are found everywhere in nature. I mean, it's the size of, it's found in the size of stars and the size of black holes and the height of trees in the Amazon rainforest. It's found in the number of plays on Spotify per artist. And so, or, or the amount of paintings or the value of paintings sold, right? And nobody would claim that, you know, Vincent van Gogh or Beyonce was taking advantage of other artists just by them being so great. And so I think it's more of a function of, you know, once you become successful, success becomes more easy to you. And so as, as wealth is built and accrued, the people who, who built it first get the, get the lion's share of the benefits, but the benefits still do rise, you know, right. rise the tide for everyone else. And that's the thing that is missed about the 1800s. Yes, there were robber barons, you know, yeah, there were, massive railroad railroads built and there were problems obviously with child labor there were problems with overall um you know i guess humane treatment of employees is definitely is definitely true but we probably had to go through that to from to evolve from an agrarian economy to an industrialized one there were we just had to make some sacrifices along the way to to get there and we did get there eventually um and so i think yeah, I think under Bitcoin standard, what will happen is probably what you're saying. A lot of people will be jealous of the whole coiners and saying yeah. it's not fair. They all have all the money. You know, you got one Bitcoin, you're rich. What the hell? 
And yeah, it is, it is unfair, but then you can work to try to, to try to get there. Completely agree. Life isn't fair. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the lesson my mother taught me, but I mean, like it's uh, something that people are going to have to come to grips with. It's like, yes, you didn't get in early, but it's still advantageous for you to use this monetary standard because it'll, even if you're on the lower end of the economic stratum, it increases your quality of life like compared to the lower rungs of the economic ladder today. You'd much prefer to be on the lower end of an economic ladder under a Bitcoin standard than a fiat money to monetary standard. It just creates an even playing field. I had a mentor uh, growing up used to say, a fair is a place where you go throw darts at a balloon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, good. That's a Marty, classic you said Texas witticism there. He was an old old guy. He was actually from Jersey, but he was in Texas when he when he shared that that wit. Um, Marty, you said something earlier that's like really positive in the sense of we always talk about incentives and in Japan and whether it's Japan or somebody else. Like at the end of the day, people have to worry about their constituents, like the people that they serve. And this idea of a country putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet to protect their capital um, and their currency is also on the, I've thought of the other side of that, which is we're talking about the Gilded Age um, and having to wait for a Bitcoin standard for some of this like productive productiveness or productive use of capital to return. And I think part of it is just the bureaucracy that exists from the state and taxes and all the things associated with it. And from a game theory perspective, we're seeing this right with the UAE, but there's other countries, El Salvador, I don't know what their, their tax policies are, but you can imagine a world where maybe even before it's a proxy or putting Bitcoin on the balance sheet is you have a favorable tax climate so you can bring more business um, growth or business formation to your local region. And then you start to, you know, have that favorable tax, um, you know, accept and put Bitcoin on your balance sheet in that way as well. You could see how this actually has a smooth, another one of these versions of transitions where we don't have to have, obviously it's still going to be bumpy, but you can like see a version of how this can play out and then becomes, um, I don't know if uniform, but like accepted by others and looked at as a playbook versus we just have to see what we saw in Weimar Republic and other places with hyperinflation. You can start to like get ahead of that. And I think like the, again, the UAE, um, El Salvador, are probably some of the first, but there's going to be others. And it isn't even necessarily have to be putting Bitcoin on the balance sheet. It can be also with just having entrepreneurs go there and making it favorable and then starting to like stack or accumulate the, the human capital there to help with that transition. Yeah. We Which should... ideally we see this more in the States, right? So we yeah. can like not have to leave. <laughs> Well, that's what I was at an event last night in Dallas, and that was one of the questions that was asked. Like, are you worried about uh, an executive order 6102 in the context of Bitcoin? Like, the government is an insane amount of debt, it's losing control. And yeah, it's something everybody should be worried about and have top of mind, but uh, maybe I'm too much of an idealist or an optimist. But you have to imagine there has to be people in the government looking at the situation and being like, we're fucked, there's nothing we can do to fix this. Like, if the government wanted to create a path of least resistance, they would just let it flourish. Like, no capital gains on Bitcoin. People can use it as money, build industry around it, let the mining industry go go nuts, and just let the like, let the market fix the problem. We're here. We're already fixing it, um, despite uh, efforts by the government to make it as hard as possible in some respects. Um, imagine if they just opened up the floodgates and let us run wild to fix these problems. I imagine we'd look back in a decade and be like, wow, we fixed a lot of these problems rather quickly. Yeah. I think I, one way, oh, sorry. No, go, you no, go for it. One way, and I've been having this this talk a lot with uh, with Bitcoiners. Um, when I was in, in Santa Marta, Colombia, I met up with a Bitcoiner who was trying to, uh, he's trying to start a business creating um, lightning channels for, for small companies and then you know, custodying it and taking a portion of the fees that they're receiving. And the issue he was finding is that, especially in these rural areas, you know, in, in LATAM, was that there wasn't 
there wasn't enough demand for Bitcoin. Like the uh, the companies might say, okay, I, I get the thesis of holding a little bit of Bitcoin as an investment, but what can I actually do as a business owner? How can this actually work towards my working capital? How can I actually utilize this on a day-to-day -day basis to pay my bills? And so he's actually a chemical engineer. And so we started talking and realized that probably the best and quickest path towards hyper-Bitcoinization is Bitcoinizing the energy and utility industries because the main thing that these restaurants needed was the ability, if they received Bitcoin, they wanted to pay someone else in that Bitcoin as well. They didn't want to just hold it, even though they might, some of them might be Bitcoin bulls and say, I, I'll take some of it. I want it to have 5% of my treasury in Bitcoin. But more than that, they would they got uncomfortable and they wanted to have uh, some ability to pay. And so I think what I'm really interested in seeing is getting some energy companies to accept Bitcoin as payment for oil and gas or for some utility company for water or electricity and allowing that to kind of percolate through the base chain of the of the production system and allowing now that now that you know electricity water gas can be paid for in bitcoin now restaurants now manufacturers now service providers can all start receiving bitcoin because now they have obviously they have bills that they can pay for it and you can start creating that circular economy yeah we're starting to see this form um at the base layer and where it makes most sense right now, which is between miners and the utilities companies that are selling them the electricity. Mm -hmm. You have companies like Satoshi Energy and Sonoda, which are creating lightning enabled um, payment channels between miners and the utilities companies that provide them the electricity where you can literally mine a block, get a reward payout from the pool and then disperse the, a payment to the utilities company to pay for your electricity on the go as you're um, consuming the electricity. And so I think that is very encouraging um, in a sense that that's where you need to start to get to the point that you just described proving bull, where it's like you start at the lowest lo layer of that stratum, which is um, where the miners are actually consuming the electricity from the utilities. And then you build up there. Once the utility gets comfortable receiving Bitcoin payments at that layer, they would be more open to um, receiving it from a retail consumer, um, a business that's paying for electricity. And so I think we're taking the first steps toward that path that ends up at that, that place that you just described. Yeah, that's great to see because, again, I think that that's what's going to accelerate the adoption faster than anything else, right? If you can pay for your gas in Bitcoin and you can pay for your electricity in Bitcoin, now suddenly millions of businesses will want Bitcoin because now they can pay. And especially if you get a discount, right? If, if they can say, hey, I'll offer you a 10% discount on your electricity bill if you pay in Bitcoin, then now there's this huge reason for all these companies to onboard. And so yeah. that'll be that'll be huge. I'm excited to hear that. And that's that's long been my thesis since I've been in the mining space for about six years now, is while many people are um, understandably and righteously focused on getting large institutions allocated to Bitcoin, whether it's corporations, uh, pension funds, countries, for that matter. I think that's all well and good and something that we should strive for. But I've been thoroughly convinced that we just need to get the energy sector because energy is arguably more important than money. It is what allows us to do everything that we do throughout the economy so that we can go mm -hmm. spend money to buy goods and services. And if you get the energy sector, which is the most important sector of the global economy um, bought in on Bitcoin. I don't think there's any turning back. They're going to be like, no, like, we need this to provide you reliable electricity. So you can't take it from us. Interesting. I, I, I agree. And, but I think that the one thing that in there that I think that, you know, money matters to all industries and all, all people, yes. all, all mm -hmm. entities. And energy is the most important industry of all, but you know, money is that base layer that it touches absolutely everything. I know, and I actually at PubKey last week, Pierre Rochard was in New York, right? Had an event, and so that was uh, that was the pub discussion late at night, uh, mm -hmm. late into the night on Thursdays. What's more important, energy or money? And if you get back to like first principles, it's like literally humans when they're agrarian, it's just like needed to eat to get energy, yeah, and do things. Yeah. I haven't been able to dig as deep. I have this book still looking that it's the, um, uh, what's the fuck? What is, uh, 
I'm it's sitting over here and it's upside down. It's the it's what is it, Daniel Jurgen, uh, the prize. I'm I'm convinced like all of the geopolitical setup that exists, specifically right going on right now, but for the past hundred plus years, ties back to what Marty's alluded to. It's it all goes to the Middle East, the energy, how it dictates all of you know uh, economics from uh, recessions to growth and the price of oil and the intermediary step that they had to go from oil to dollars. And so it's like that base level. If that changes, then everything else is a derivative of that. And so by proxy, if you can have a different form of currency or value required for the thing that everything's a derivative of like petroleum across everything globally, you can actually influence downstream everything else and how you value the, the currency. There's, there's a thread there that I'm going to fully tie because I need to finish reading this book, but to, to Marty's point, like all of the oil sitting in the Middle East has historically had to go into dollar before it can actually get turned into anything else. And that idea goes back to like 50% in a future state in a Bitcoin world is half energy that goes to Bitcoin and half goes into uh, you know, economies to serve whatever is needed of that energy. That's how this ends up and solves for a lot of that, like geopolitical strife that happens right now. Hmm. Yeah. And we're, you know, we're seeing the early stages of that play out, right? Like I, I've done a lot of research on what's been happening with the BRICS. Um, and this year, this last year, BRICS went further than ever before in expanding. They added like six new members. Um, the Chinese central bank, signed a swap line agreement with the Saudis to the tune of oil transports in Yuan. Um, and so that's, that's a huge development and, and it, Egypt as well issued a uh, Panda bonds, which are bonds denominated in Yuan. And so there's been a move across the middle East um, to start to de-dollarize and to remove, you know, dollar exposure from uh, their oil trade. And it's been really interesting to see because that move alone has started to flow funds back into China. And now these companies can use Yuan to buy gold on the Shanghai exchange, which is um, physically settled. And that can push the price of gold up, which has been pulling up Western gold prices as well. Um, I looks like my internet's a little slow. So apologies if any of that cut out, but. It's all good. I think the one stat was the, the amount that the swap swap line was was it 10 billion what was it 58 billion 58 billion. Remember. yeah 58 billion pretty um, substantial yeah, yeah. And that's and now that you mention all that it really uh makes the the mainstream media narrative uh, which has become very anti-china with the tiktok ban and um uh conversations about chinese meddling in the u.s uh, are picking up steam. And I wonder if that's just uh, an externality of the situation you're describing between the BRICS, where the American government and the intelligence apparatus and the military industrial apparatus sees these economic moves that China's making and is lately retaliating um, in other ways, whether it's a TikTok ban or I saw that they're looking to sanction some banks um, as well. Um, which is just like, hey, don't do that. We'll, we'll mm-hmm. cut your companies out of the U.S. What was yeah, the thing? I, I... It, it's kind of on that thread of like, uh, I forgot who shared with Russia and like they took the top 10 company like assets. It was an American company. It was like a tit for tat for the, the treasury, um, for the, the treasury sanctions or, or taking their, their, um, their bonds. It was in... I don't know if Marty, you shared it, but there was a, a top 10, I want to say like wheat producer, US based firm in Russia that uh, the Russian government effectively like seized uh, and said, like, hey, this is ours now. <laughs> from, uh, I forgot where it was, but from a geopolitical perspective, this whole notion of like mm-hmm. the idea that, you know, um, like global politics and having a country's assets sit in a different foreign region like China. And it's the U.S. base or like TikTok now, uh, this whole thing is like up for grabs for like what is actually owned, i.e., you know, treasury mm-hmm. bonds. Yeah. It's really sad, too. Just think about it. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't want to come off like an idealist hippie, but <laughs> like we should live in a world where Russia can produce their gas, their wheat, whatever. China can produce their cheap goods. Um, and we're able to trade freely. We shouldn't have all this uh, uh, xenophobic posturing uh, in terms of like we need to cut this company out of this country and that company out of that country. We should be able to trade um, division of labor globally, produce your own goods, sell it to the world. Um, mm-hmm. Again, I'm sorry if I'm coming off like a hippie, but <laughs> I think the governments have uh, have really uh, they're in this dick measuring contest for control over the global monetary system, and it it leads to all this um, strife and potentially unnecessary conflict. Um, yeah, because that in the Bitcoin mining industry, I mean, we work. Just naturally, with a lot of Chinese people, um, and from what I've observed, like the Chinese miners are arguably like the most capitalistic individuals within the Bitcoin space, bar none. Um, hmm. And it's extremely impressive what they've been able to do over the last fifteen years. And I don't know, I personally um, admire what they've been able to do and, and how they operate. Um, it's just weird that uh, the American government wants me to hate these people. Hmm. Yeah, and I I think that a lot of this comes from you know the out the outcome of of there being centralized global reserve currencies that are fiat based, right? Yep. Because this is and Triffin pointed this out. Robert Triffin, an economist, pointed this out in in 1960 in an address to Congress that you know we we had a dilemma where we could either continue to run current account deficits, sending out more money into the world to fund global trade, but that would bury us in debt and cause an eventual crisis and eventually cause us to lose our global reserve currency um, and break the gold peg. Or we could not do those fund those deficits. We could not send out money to the global economy on net. And then that would mean that the global economy would stop because there wouldn't be enough dollars to fund global trade and to settle debt and uh, for currency reserves for central foreign central banks. And so the the U.S. obviously has a huge incentive to maintain their hegemony and to maintain the dollar system working as it does today. And BRICS obviously now is is making moves to try to counteract that and to create a BRICS currency. But, um, you know, Brent Johnson points this, points this out wonderfully. Like, if you don't trust the dollar, how much less can you trust China and Russia and India? Yeah, it's never going to work currency. Out. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 ridiculous, and that's why it's so funny to me that they don't see Bitcoin as a solution yet. Because right. Bitcoin, as a non centrally issued currency, right, a decentralized currency, it doesn't it, Triffin's dilemma doesn't apply. It solves the dilemma. It doesn't have the issue of of external demand versus internal supply. And so, once you adopt Bitcoin as a as the neutral global uh, monetary asset. You don't have to worry about these issues about, you know, currency blowouts or, uh, you know, one country having too much of a current account deficit because all of it becomes self-settling, just like it was in the 1800s. When if a country does has too much deficits and too much inflation, their currency will devalue and gold will flow out of that country until they raise rates and have enough deflation to pull it back in. And so that the same thing could happen on a Bitcoin standard. Um, and so it's I'm I'm excited to see which country will start being the first one to stack Bitcoin on their balance sheet. I know it sounds like El Salvador already has some, you know, I think, is it the Central African Republic of the Congo or Central? What, there's a yeah, small country in Africa that, that does it as well. Bhutan yeah, they, they, has it in their sovereign wealth fund. Mm-hmm. So. The Central African Republic um, kind of went down the shitcoin path real quick <laughs> after they embraced Bitcoin. Any so such cases. Not reliable anymore. No, but it's, I mean, it makes sense that the BRICS would do this. I mean, they've just watched the United States dominate the world over the last 50 years because they had control Mm -hmm. over the global reserve currency. And you can see why they would want to have similar control um, moving forward. I mean, it's very alluring uh, being able to control the levers of the global monetary system. But as you mentioned, like, to think they're going to be able to competently manage a fiat monetary system is laughable. Um, they should all just adopt a Bitcoin standard as quickly right. as possible. Marty, to your point earlier, like <clears throat> everyone's searching for a, a reliable neutral reserve asset they can they can trust. Um, and, and the BRICS won't, just won't be able to 
offer that, um, the reliability portion of it being insufficient, I think. Um, but everyone's searching for a neutral reserve asset and the energy industry more than anyone. Um, and you know, that there's, there's a, a give and take where the energy industry like blesses a certain currency as like, okay, we're going to do trade in this currency. And then that becomes the single biggest, like, like, you know, weight on the scale of, of what's going to become the global reserve currency for that period, that era. And obviously the U S um, the, the thing that can, the feedback loop is, is force, right? So you, if you have the strongest military, you can impose that, all right, we're going to use our currency to, to settle energy trade. And then that helps that currency become the reserve currency for the world. And that's what we, we saw over the last half century. But the energy industry is constantly searching for, you know, a, the best currency for them to use, a neutral reserve currency that they can settle in. And, and the way that Bitcoin integrates with the energy industry makes it sort of inevitable that it's, it's energy, energy money. It's, it's rooted in the energy industry and that eventually will mean the energy industry increasingly putting their chips on that currency, this new upstart currency. Um, and eventually the, the, you know, the, the weight that they have on the scales on the side of the U S dollar will shift to Bitcoin. And, you know, you've got the vote of confidence of the, uh, the biggest industry in the world. Um, that's going to move the needle more than anything else could towards global, global reserve currency status for Bitcoin. I completely agree. It, it, it's like a flywheel effect, right? Yeah. Like once you get, and I think I talked to him. I was on. Um, oh no, did I cut out yeah. again? We just we lost you for the last five seconds. Okay. You talked to somebody? Ah, dang, it's, sorry about this internet problem. It's uh, Wi-Fi here in Columbia spot, even though I'm in a, a co-working spot and paying for premium, but, um, yeah, no, I was, I think I was talking to you about this Marty on, on our podcast, uh, last year that, you know, it's a flywheel effect where once you get a few countries accepting Bitcoin, especially like what you said, Jesse, uh, accepting Bitcoin as payment for energy, then other countries will suddenly have a need to have it in their treasury and other businesses will need need to have it in their treasury and they'll have to all scramble to bu rush and buy Bitcoin. And it'll just drag in more and more countries, and then this becomes see a supermajority of countries needing and owning and trading Bitcoin for their energy and and their financial needs, right? To settle energy trade. And, you know, it's you know, yeah. So I was just saying, you know, what's so exciting is that like thought or that uh, notion would seem so insane. But it's it's going to happen in like just by what we just saw with like Hong Kong and the ETFs in the West. Like that yeah. idea would have been crazy years ago, and global it's about to happen. Global yeah. competition for the asset, and so it's already there. It's like it's just how, and it, I don't even think it's years from now. It's just a few, you know, whether it's six, twelve, eighteen, twenty-four well, months for this all to start happening. What it really is is a liquidity problem. So I've talked to. Nas El Haji a lot about this over the years, who's an oil and gas expert, really understands the international oil and gas markets intuitively. And I brought this up to him because it makes a lot of sense. It's this apolitical settlement layer that people should be doing trades in. And he brought up a good point. It's just a liquidity problem at this, this point. If you wanted to do large international oil trades using Bitcoin, um, the, the liquidity profile simply isn't up to snuff yet. So... Maybe when we get to a five, ten trillion dollar market, it makes a lot more sense. But it, I think that will come, whether or not it's in two, five, ten years, whatever it may be. It's just the timing of how quickly can Bitcoin develop the liquidity profile that would be necessary to facilitate these trades and this apolitical settlement layer is just like the first uh, part of that. Like when you think of uh, this, the asset, like it's a great asset to do these trades in. But then you think of the tech of it, like again. What, on ramps working on like multi sig escrow, like you can really innovate when it comes to credit lines for these large trades. You put Bitcoin in a in a multi sig with three different parties that have different incentives within that trade. Uh, 
two counterparties in the trade and an impartial third party to release the funds when the goods have been delivered. Like that creates capital efficiencies that simply don't exist or are impossible today. Um, so the yeah. benefits of doing this over Bitcoin are, are multifaceted. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that from the miners hearing about how people bought miners for years and just somebody sends a wire and they hope to go or Bitcoin and they hope to God they show up. I've been thinking about it, about like this idea of multisig and, and escrow. And it's actually, if you think about it, it's a problem that exists in everything, specifically even in Bitcoin buys right now. Somebody has to send the dollars and somebody has to send the Bitcoin. And as we, if we're in a bull market for trust breaking down, you're going to have to have other trust minimized ways to deliver goods and services, i.e. a billion dollar oil tanker or a billion dollars of Bitcoin for whatever unit you're buying, whether it's gold. And so the natural like multi-six properties were just in the first early innings of that. Um, the, I think Marty, I think the liquidity is like one aspect of it. I think it's the education as well, right? Like the idea, because you can set yeah, education, education begets that. liquidity, right? As people become more educated, they're like, oh, I need Bitcoin. They dump their money into it and liquidity comes. Well, I guess the other side is because you could settle $10 million or $100 million for oil or even potentially a billion with what we know of Tesla coming in and, and the liquidity was there. I mean, more of like just the fact that you can trust a multi-sig and understand it because the other side of this is like everything BlackRock and all the tokenized and all the crap that's coming. It's like the game's not going to be as easy as convincing everybody Bitcoin's the thing because everybody else is going to go shill everything else under the sun that's crypto or blockchain related and it's going to just like obfuscate what's actually happening it's we're just gonna it's it's gonna be a it's gonna be a cat and mouse game of like just people getting rugged <laughs> on a yeah. geopolitical scale this panel i was on last thursday um unfortunately leads me to believe we're not getting away from this stuff anytime soon but um <clears throat> if you're out there and you're in the international energy trading markets don't fall for the tokenized. You don't need to tokenize your barrels of oil or your units of natural gas or your LNG. You simply, you do your work. You, you extract the, the energy. You package it up. You put it on a ship. You deliver it. Um, you don't need to tokenize. You just put Bitcoin in a multi-sig escrow. You deliver the goods. Your counterparty puts Bitcoin in a multi-sig escrow. You deliver the goods, and you get the money. It's very simple. Don't complicate it. You don't need to tokenize everything. You don't need to take on all that compliance and tech costs that come with trying to tokenize the world. Uh, it's simple. Do your thing in the physical world, deliver your goods, and you'll get the Bitcoin. You don't need to do anything else. We're going to have like five years of rugging. If you think about the past five years of FTX, it's going to be that, but like 10 act in what you're describing. Because <laughs> it's just not, how do you extract rent from that system? You got to build a bunch of wallets and, you know, smart contracts and, you had a tweet yesterday about like the fire in India. Was it like what are the carbon credits to offset that fire? <laughs> like, like... Dude, they're literally. I think it's emitting. Uh, it's very ironic too. I found out today that that fire was started by a lithium iron ion battery that was thrown <laughs> or so. And um, and yeah, I th that's, think that thing's emitting more methane than in like an hour than the UK does in a year right now. And Apparently, it's not going to stop burning anytime soon. So, yeah, this is why the whole BlackRock thing was always worrisome for me. Is like the you know, Marty, we've been talking about it for over a year. It's like this slow drumbeat of securitization and digitization of all assets is like permeating traditional finance, and it's only going to continue. And BlackRock's going to lead the charge, and it's just going to completely obfuscate like what is Bitcoin, what's exposure to Bitcoin, what are all the things around it. Um, and so no, we're just going to see all the. Yeah. It's coming from all sides. That's the TradFi thesis this cycle. And then this panel I was on, somebody was seriously shilling um, meme coins replacing social media. This is the future of social media is meme coins. Attaching a and, and there's a conf They conflate like the bureaucracy and the muckiness that exists in the traditional world. And so they believe like a blockchain fixes it. And it's like they're, they're just missing like the forest to the trees, of, like what's actually fucked up. Because like directionally, they know something's wrong, so they're assuming like you need a blockchain to fix yeah, this it's, stuff. It's just, again, it's, anybody listening, what what's been fucked up is capital markets. They fucked up capital markets because the capital underlying those markets is not real; it's fake money. Um, you just need to fix the capital markets with good money, and then you keep doing what you're doing in the physical world. You don't need to tokenize and digitize everything. Mm -hmm. the, the the thread or narrative we have to hammer home is Bitcoin is money, and everything else is credit. 
So if you want the money, then you take, you hold the Bitcoin. If you want to claim on some other crap, then you can have the token or whatever that's it's, out there. It's, it's, it's very simple. Don't overthink this. Don't overthink this. It's simple. <laughs> Bitcoin is the great definancialization. Yeah, and that's actually what we want, right? We don't want things to be over financialized. We don't want things to be over overly overly leveraged overly traded right we don't want you know 200 times the gold uh mining production in the world being traded every year we want things we want markets to be real and to be based in reality and so by going back to the bitcoin standard or sound money standard that will fix this underlying issue and it's not even to mention right like on the blockchain point blockchains people think that blockchains are like the silver bullet that will solve every single problem. You could throw it at anything and it will make it better, right? Oh, if I have cancer, if I have a blockchain token, it'll it'll cure me, right? And that's completely ridiculous because blockchains, you know, it's kind of like a tank, right? It's a really specialized tool that can do one thing really well, but you wouldn't want to drive a tank, you know, to work every day and you wouldn't want to use it to do a road trip or to pick up your grandma. And so if you're going to use a blockchain, you have to know that you're giving off, you have massive trade-offs and you're optimizing for, you know, one or two things, which is decentralization and security. And so if you want to optimize for that, then you can use a blockchain. But all these tokens that claim that they can do everything, right? They have more throughput than Visa and they have more fina faster finality than Bitcoin and better throughput than ETH. And, you know, it's just, it's just, ludicrous like solana is a good example solana i think has i think i remember reading that solana had like a block time of like 200 milliseconds and they said basically like that means no but like 85 percent of the world doesn't have an internet internet speed fast enough to to finalize transactions in the solana blockchain and the only ones who can do it are software engineers sitting at data centers in at google or Facebook or Amazon, right? You have like a super fast internet speed to do it. And so you're giving off those trade-offs. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, blockchains only, I mean, we can get into it. Blockchain, yeah. Blockchains only work too. They're slow, dumb. I mean, the ones that matter are slow, dumb and specialized and they're only incentivized via mm -hmm. hard money. Like it only works. Block production, the blockchain only grows uh, if miners are incentivized to keep it growing and to validate and process transactions. And you need a scarce token, a good money to incentivize that, and it's Bitcoin. Once you have that, everything else is competing with Bitcoin. And it's far, uh, far inferior monetary properties compared to Bitcoin, so it doesn't even make sense trying to spin up another blockchain. And yet, we're going to have to live through it. Yeah. You need the implicit link to the real world, um, which Bitcoin has through its connection to, the, to energy production. But you need you you need there to not be an explicit link to the real world, like all these tokenized real world asset bullshit. That fundamentally, like you can't put a, a real world asset on the blockchain because at the end of the day, there's a link between that blockchain and the real world that is just enforced by law yeah uh, yeah you put a pepsi okay. on the blockchain and you go to the vending machine you buy your pepsi you own it on the blockchain but if i come and i rip it out of your hand and drink it that was my pepsi right. <laughs> you, you need to there's... not have an explicit link but you also need to have the implicit link um so it's a it's a funny thing that people have not yet wrapped their heads around Gentlemen, this has been great. I know you got to run, Michael. Um, Michael's got to go take the tank to pick up Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> Peruvian bull. Any uh, any final thoughts before we wrap up here? Uh, no, nothing, nothing huge. Uh, thanks for inviting me on. Um, I'm pretty active on Twitter and I have my Substack. So if people want to read more about macro stuff, you can go and sub there. Um, I'm going to try to make it to the Bitcoin conference. And so if you guys are going to be there, let me know. I'll definitely be down to meet up uh, and talk. And hopefully I can squeeze in to, to have a speech. Um, we'll see. I was able to do that at the Adopting Bitcoin conference, which was a great time. And, and hopefully I'll be able to do that again. So we'll see. Hell yeah. It sounds like Marty's having a big event in uh, the conference. You want to you want to shill the event? Just heard about that. Uh, well, PubKey and Rabbit Hole Recap have teamed up. 
They do a live event Thursday, I believe the 25th of July. The name of the venue is escaping me, but we're going to do a live show, 600 tickets. Uh, not on sale yet, but we'll keep you guys updated. Is it on a That's rooftop? or? No, not this time. It's, uh, it's in a venue. Nice. Upgrade, I guess. But less or more than 100K by conference. No, I'm not doing <laughs> multiples by conference day. That meme has uh, haunted rabbit hole recap. Matt specifically uh, in the past. I'm not going to make the same mistake that he made, but 150k. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. We well, appreciate you coming on, proving. Hopefully, we can. Uh, we'll see you in the states at some point this year. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me on. Yeah. Thanks for coming. All right. Thanks, guys. See you guys next week.